Oh, hello, everyone. Uh, that's quite a hard act to follow, Joe. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Thanks to Sherman, uh, to Furman and the team for inviting me. I'm going to uh, just start speaking while, or I hope I'm going to start speaking while just playing a, a very short film. This is a, I'm afraid it is a little bit about our work or all about our work, but it was made for our 25th uh, anniversary. And it's not the full film because that would be uh, that would be four and a half minutes, um, and I didn't want to take up all of our all of my my 20 minutes. Um, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna play the film in a second. I just wanted to start off by saying something, uh, reading you something from one of my favourite writers, um, Toni Morrison, and my friend Leslie Loco quoted this in, the, in a press conference in Venice recently, except she attributed it to Oprah Winfrey, but. <laughs> She says, I've learned that people will, will forget what you've said and they'll forget what you did, that they'll never forget how you make them feel. And I, I wanted to talk a little bit about that today. I, I haven't got family photographs, um, but I have got some projects that I, wanted to, that I wanted to talk to you about that have been very personal to me in terms of how, I suppose, I have developed as an architect. I find it almost impossible to talk about myself um, in, in terms of practice because I've always practiced in a group uh, with a, a team of amazing people around me. Um, I started, Michelle and I started our practice uh, in 1994, as you've already heard, but we met on our first day of our first year at university and we were friends from then. So we have run a practice together for 27 years or whatever it is now but you know then it, our relationship goes back a lot longer than that so for me to single out things that are personal to me and important to me and have formed me as an architect are, are difficult but as you also just heard I did do a PhD which took far too long and I finished it last year so that required a bit of soul searching too um, this film, short version of a film, was made by a, a photographer called Dennis Gilbert, who unfortunately died in 2021. We worked with Dennis from day one. Um, he, we, we worked with him from before we could afford to pay him. Um, he always knew we'd pay him eventually. But um, he went back after 25 years to some of our, our projects and filmed them. And that's, that was terrifying. I mean, some, we didn't even know what some of them would, we hadn't been back to some of them ourselves. Um, so that was, that was an amazing uh, experience. And he made this absolutely poetic and beautiful film about, well, I think I've just stopped it, but I'm, no, no, I haven't, um, uh, of, of, which is, was a sort of collage of a portfolio of, of work that had been built up over, over all this time. Um, and um, I, I, I look at these, we look at, we, we're very proud of the work that we do. We run a, 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 a I suppose we run a sort of family business, um, which makes it sound like Michelle and I are married. Um, we're not. A lot of people ask us if we are, but um, we're not. Um, and our, but, you know, we, the, every project we do is so um, personal. Uh, we have extremely personal relationships with our clients. We keep our clients stay on as friends. We, we you know, we've known some of them for, for such a long time. Um, so I'm, I'm going to speak when this little film finishes in a minute, I'm, uh, I'm going to speak about five projects that have been, I suppose, um, have been very personal to me for a number of reasons. And I'll just, I'll just wait for the film to finish. And then I will, I'm going to read you, I can't see the quotes without my there are a few quotes in here and I can't see them without our glasses, so I'm gonna read you just one of them. Don't worry, it'll be the only one. So we finish here in Regent High School, which is a, uh, a, where you also heard I'm a governor. So this has been a real labor of love, this project from 14 phases of construction work to um, staying involved with the school. It's been on open house seven times, I think, and, and I'm now a governor there. So um, I wanted to start with this project. Um, when, we, when I was a first year student, we had this extraordinary uh, professor of architecture called Barry Bierman. 
I would I would not be surprised if no one, in, if anyone, well, I would be surprised if anyone in this room had ever heard of him. But he was an incredible um, history and philosophy teacher. And at the end of uh, my second year, I said, "Where should I go? I'm going on going on a grand tour of Europe." Um, and he said, "You need to go to this temple, um, and it's the Temple of Apollo at Vassi uh, in Arcadia." And I wanted to just read you something written by Vincent Scully from a book called The Earth, the Temple and the Gods. Uh, Vincent Scully is still to this day one of my favorite um, architectural historians and someone I refer back to all the time. It's, and he writes, set in a remote corner of Arcadia, the temple is a geometric contrast to the forms of the earth, yet landscape and, architectural, and architecture form one architectural whole. The Doric columns are a grove of trees. The temple's connection to the earth, enhanced by its setting high up on a rocky ridge. As you walk up from the Nether Gorge, the temple remains invisible until you come across a stream, and then suddenly it's there, a geometric order framed against the sky. The drama of the approach is exaggerated as the route forces you to move around the temple and see it in three dimensions. The geometric abstract form stands out as an expression of human order against the chaotic hills. It rides its own rocky ridge, like a perfectly stable boat on the crest of a mountainous wave. And I, I went and hiked up the gorge with a friend of, of mine, and we, we camped on the floor of this temple. There was nobody around. Uh, the moon came up, the moon set, and it was just the most extraordinary experience. This, and, and this purity of form, this purity of geometry, this simplicity um, just stayed with me. I, I lost my camera um, on the way uh, back. Um, and I, I don't, so all, hundreds of photographs that I took of this extraordinary experience were lost. And I think one of the reasons it's seared into my memory is because I don't have any photographs of it. I have to borrow drawings and photographs out of Vincent Scully's book. And it's been covered in scaffolding for, I think, the last 30 years. It's now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So, um, but it, it just had the most powerful effect on me and uh, uh, that, that sort of synthesis of landscape and architecture and geometry and form. And then the next project is, is uh, the Teatro del Mondo by Aldo Rossi. Um, and this was made for the first Biennale, the first architecture Biennale in 1980. I didn't get to Venice until, uh, for the first time ever until 1983 as part of the same trip. And I had to make do with seeing this project um, on an exhibition and with a, a short film about it. But it just, and I, the second book that I'd read that really moved me was Aldo Rossi's Architecture of the City. And I thought, if, if somebody could make this extraordinary thing, which was about architecture and memory and have this understanding of the city as an entity as, a, as a, a thing that, an organic thing that moves and grows. And if you take something as absurd uh, as Peter Cook described it just the other day as Venice, it's, it, you know, I just was mesmerized by this, that somebody would have this understanding of a city that was so poetic that you could make something like this, this floating theater that was going to be dragged into Venice on the back of a tug, on, with, by a tugboat and moored in various places for this Biennale. And it was a theater. You could go into the theater and you could watch a play. Um, and I, I, that, that stuck with me, that, that architecture, or that architecture can be so lyrical and so poetic and so reduced to these simple forms and simple, simple experiences. And I never went inside, but people talked about walking in and smelling the timber that the, that the, the theater was made of. And that, that really stayed with me, this project. The next one is La Tourette uh, Monastery by Le Corbusier. And the, I went on a road trip with a friend and we stopped at La Tourette. Um, we, were, we were allowed, ridiculously now to think of it, but we were allowed to go up onto the roof. That hole in the roof is a skylight um, that goes up onto a... Um, a, a rooftop and we were allowed to go up there with our bottle of wine and our bread and cheese and sit up there and, and, and listen to the, 
the monks singing um, down below. And I, I just never, I, I suppose it, it was just one, another one of those moments of being in this extraordinary place that was about space and light and order. Um, something Le Corbusier did, Le Corbusier did extraordinarily well, um, the master probably. Um, and then sitting on this roof and watching the sunset and looking over the French countryside and and just it was just an incredibly powerful experience um, of being in that surrounded by that much beauty um, but and it started to occur to me that you could make architecture out of next to nothing and make it that exquisite and that beautiful you didn't need fancy finishes or expensive materials um, and that 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 stayed with me for that has stayed with me ever since and then I, I love surprises, and um, I went to Chile on a, a RIBA validation visit. And at the end of the visit, I asked an architecture student in a school of architecture which, uh, was, his, which is, was his favorite local building, and he told me about this one. Um, there's nothing, or, uh, there's, there's some words on this slide that I wrote uh, for an article for BD. There's almost nothing known about this, um, this project, um, and it's up high on the hill with the Andes behind. It's, um, it's again, a, an incredibly modest and simple building. There's sort of two interlocking forms uh, and it's got a rawness and a, and a purity about it that was just so strong. I was just, it took my breath away. I walked into the space and saw how these rough painted block work, concrete walls were just and the way the light had been placed, or the way the light slots had been placed to bring the light in and bring it into the center of the space was just, was just wonderful. Um, and I've, I've, I've always just, I've since then, tried to find something published about this work. It was, it was made by two young architecture students, was built by two young architecture students, designed and built, who were part of this monastery, becoming monks. And they, they then stayed on and became monks, but and this was the only building they ever built. Um, but it, it, was, it, 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 it had a very, very strong effect on me and made me just feel again that you can do so much, make such beautiful things and make and with so, so little. And then Peter Zumthor, who's you know, been a, a lifelong sort of, you know, um, somebody I, whose work I've admired and from a distance, I looked at this Bruder Klaus Chapel, this building, in books and read about it and used it in so many uh, presentations to clients, talking about this, you know, this simple form and talking about this extraordinary idea of burning, of building this kind of formwork out of logs and uh, of, and then burning them, so you get this incredible sort of charred timber interior, this extraordinary, uh, extraordinary. Uh, space, but I, I, and I, I'd never, I'd never been there until and I, I wrote about it while I was doing this PhD. So I, I went to, I went, took myself off there and went and had a look. And I don't know if it's because I'd been, I'd seen it, so many in so many photographs and in so many books, and I'd, I'd, I'd talked about it so much, especially when we were doing this, um, this Buddhist retreat that was referred about, referred to earlier. Uh, that you know, it, 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 I just sort of walked in and thought, oh yeah, okay, because I just it felt like I'd, I knew it so well and I'd been there before, but it 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 was a very uh, a very moving experience. And the the thing that made me think about was this idea of how uh, coming back to how how space or buildings make you feel is this idea of atmosphere. It's quite difficult to create, you know, atmosphere. And I I you know this. This little composition captures, or captures two things, weathering and atmosphere. And I, I've always just, I, you know, I, I just thought it was, it was absolutely masterful, as, along with many of, of Peter Zumthor's other buildings. There's just a, a, a simplicity and a, a paucity of materials that just, you know, and the a beauty of composition that is just, um, it, it is, is, is wonderful. So those, those projects, I think, those five projects, um, quite varied in different countries by different architects at, from a huge range of different um, periods of history have, have, have you know, came together 
in um, or influenced, strongly influenced um, a project that we delivered for a, a Buddhist community. And I'm going to show you a short clip of it, which has got me talking in it. And I'm sorry, Furman, I know we're not allowed to talk about our own work. I, I'm not, I don't really want to show it as a project that um, is, is, is a, you know, because it's one of our projects. Uh, there were a couple of things that were very important about it for, for me. Um, one was working with a Buddhist community. Um, we like working with communities of all sorts and, and working with faith communities is fun. But this, the way this project was run was so extraordinary. There was just, a, a, right from the word go, there was this sort of culture in the project of everybody working together. Yeah, things went wrong, but you know, we all kind of mucked in and, and sorted it out. Um, and this went all the way through to the contractors um, you know, everybody on site just made sure that this project happened in the most beautiful way. Um, and I've been back a number of times. I go there all the time. I was there this week. I've been on retreats there myself. Um, and it's just, it, it strikes me whenever I go there, and I know it, you know, possibly better than a lot of people, you know, how, how, you know, you can, how you, the, the power of walking into the space and how it makes you feel. So I'm going to try in this little film just to show you, um, give you a sense of, of that. Um, and let's see if it'll work. Oh yeah, there's, um, that's our, that's the, the project architect and our client uh, and uh, in, in that space and a, a lovely quote, which I can't read because I can't see it from here. Um, by a photogra another photographer called James Newton, who went there on, on retreat and talks about how about the architecture disappearing, um, which I quite liked. So um, our aim here was to design a, a Buddhist retreat for a Western Buddhist order. Western Buddhism is relatively new. Um, the order was started in the 1960s. Western Buddhism predates that, but not, not by a huge amount. Um, so we, there was a theological aspect to the design brief too. We were designing a place for where Western Buddhism could be practiced. The concept of arranging space around courtyards came very early on as a direct response to the landscape and to the conditions on the site and the fact that it's quite often windy. And we wanted people to feel safe and protected, but also very directly connected to the landscape. The idea of the, the sort of not only enclosing these spaces uh, with buildings, but, but also trying to make the space, the walls as perforated as possible, either by framing views of the landscape or by perforating the walls themselves, um, was, was something we sort of stumbled upon as an idea, um, hoped it would work, and it's ended up defining the place really because it creates these the separation but also never you never feel disconnected from one space to the other or from the outside until you arrive in the shrine room which is where your you know your focus is on the on the object of your devotion on the buddha figure rather than on the outside so there then then the the spatial experience is reversed I like to think any architect worth their salt could have designed a beautiful building on this site because it's a very beautiful site and the brief was an amazing one-off brief. But we had an awful lot of dialogue and discussion with the client on uh, during the course of this process on how to make sure that it would actually allow people to do what they describe as deepening their practice. It was very, very interesting people's responses because a lot of people have been speechless. And at, at first I used to think, oh, well, does this mean they don't like it? And then people started coming to me days later sometimes, or writing to me and saying, I'm really sorry I couldn't say anything. It's so beautiful, it's so moving, I didn't know what to say. It's remarkable how many people get tearful just with the beauty of the place. And that's quite something for the architects to have achieved, you know, that's something that has such a positive... Um, emotional and spiritual effect. I think it's a wonderful gift they've given us. So that's, that's it really. Um, I just, that's, I hope that was of interest and, and I hope that's the end of my little talk. Thank you for the beautiful talk. It was very, 
Yeah, unexpected as talking about these buildings that have had an impact on you. Uh, it's very personal, and it brings to my mind and I guess the, people, the mind of many of, of us the importance of traveling and visiting buildings that move you in a way, that kind of give you a, a, a meaning of, of the profession. But I would to, like to go to the personal side of you, if it's okay. Um, in, as in many interviews, for example, you, have, you mentioned that, that inclusion and equality is something that is a very, very important topic for you. And I have always wonders, wonder in these months of preparations, um, when you think of, of inclusion, or when you think of unfairness, what experience or experiences come to your mind? <laughs> uh, well, we have a, a profession that's predominantly, you know, white and male, so I, th I suppose that's, uh, that's a starting point. Uh, uh, you know, Michelle and I started a practice, we were told, <laughs> at a, a, a lecture we gave at the Glasgow School of Art. We were introduced as um, the first two women in the UK to start an architectural practice, and we thought, oh, that's just silly. Of course we're not. That can't be true. Um, but we've never actually managed to disprove that. So, um, and we tried quite hard. So I think we must probably were the first two women um, to start a practice in the UK. And I think it was because we were, we just didn't have a clue what we were doing really. We, we were young and we were foreign and, and we just didn't think anyone would dare to discriminate against us, I suppose. Um, mm. And, but you know, our profession is, is very discriminatory and very, mm, you know, homogenous and, and there's a lot of examples of, of discrimination within our profession, so and that's just a fact. Mm. Um, our office is was started off being 100% women. Uh, it's now, we have dropped down to about 70%. Um, but, you know, it, and it's still, I think, seen as a safe place. And I think we don't, you know, we don't, we interview everybody and we take people, the best person at interview, but I think we have more women applying to us, I, it's the only conclusion I can come to. So mm. it's very, it's something that's extremely important to me. I, you know, I try and apply it in every, every aspect of what, what I do. Um, I feel like I'm not answering your question. But no, no, I'm going back <laughs> because that, that opens some questions that, um, that came to my mind. Uh, for example, someone say to you and Michelle that if you know a man, a man that could help you to <laughs> present yourself at the beginning of your, uh, of your young practice, right? Because two <laughs> women have a practice that, would, that they sh should really need a, a man to, to go to talk to it people, was very right? It was very well-intentioned. Well-intentioned, yeah. But he, and, and he probably knew a lot more than we knew. Um, I think he, you know, as I said, you know, we were young and, you know, we, we weren't too encumbered by, uh, by reality at that point, I don't think. And he genuinely thought, you know, we were going to have a really tough time. Yeah. And he thought if we needed someone to come and help us in a meeting who was, you know, oh, a little bit older and a man, that we should call on him. We never needed to, but mm. it was, you know, I, I think he made that offer in, in, the, in, the kindest, in, in the kindest way possible, but also knowing, you know, Knowing the reality of the profession, mm. um, yeah. Many changes have, many uh, things have changed in this decade. Hopefully, with uh, with women or female architects, um, would you like to see something changing? Some more changes uh, to be happening in the industry? Yeah, you know, I'd like fifty percent of the profession to be women at least. You know, fifty percent of students are women, mm -hmm. if not more, um, and, you know, there are, you know, that, that would be a good place to start. Um, I'm not sure it's going to happen um, mm -hmm. while our profession is, you know, is, is a sort of long hours culture that's not very well paid, but, you know, we're, we're hopefully heading in the right direction, although there's still a, you know, you say lots changed. Has it? I know still an awful lot I of the profession that is so. not uh, is it's not just the gender issue, you know, there's a, an awful lot of our profession that's not inclusive at all mm. um, to lots of other people, 
um, people from different cultural backgrounds, people from different racial backgrounds. It's not, you know, it's, ju it's just not. But hopefully, as you say, it's, it's moving in the right direction. Now I would like to come back to, the, to that first question. And is, now that you are in a stab, at the beginning, there were so many factors that were challenging. Mm -hmm. um, now you are in an established position. How if will you, you like, so. if it's <laughs> in a better position? <laughs> yeah. Uh, now that you have, you're in a better position, how will you like to help uh, to, yeah, to support inclusion and, and equality? I mean, I, hopefully I already do. Um, you know, we, we all do, not just me, um, with the kind of practice we run. Our practice is pretty unusual. Um, I think, not just because it's predominantly uh, female, um, over 70%, and almost a lot of our senior team are, are women. Um, but, you know, pe people always ask us, do you do design buildings differently because you're women? Well, of, of course we don't. Um, but we, I think we probably do run our practice differently. We, you know, in, uh, we try to make the, you know, the practice a, a good place to work. A, a safe place to work, an encouraging and supportive place to work. So just in terms of the day-to-day -day of what we do and how we run our practice, um, you know, that's, we try and make little mm. changes. Um, I, maybe, I'm sure, I'm sure I could be doing more. Um, you know, we, when I took over as chair of the Architecture Foundation, we went, we, we made a very conscious effort to restructure a lot of, of what we were, and our board and, and other mm -hmm. things and our program so that it was, you know, it's more representative of London. And that took a while, but it's happened now and it, it feels like it was the right thing to do. Um, you also say that you're talking about your office and how it works and how you run the practice. You talk about then um, mentioning that it's, that it's like a family. I've mm -hmm. read at least. <laughs> um, what do you consider important in word? Maybe if it's a short answer. Um, on one hand, what do you consider important to have a good work environment? And on the other hand, what team members have to bring to your table, to the family table? Wow. Um, yeah, we have... Uh, to make a good working environment is... is Difficult. I mean, we're architects, you know, we, people still work long hours. We, you know, we're not perfect, but we do try and, you know, we, we employ a lot of people who are young parents, um, you know, they have children, children get sick, you know, there are, you know, we try, we make, we try and make it a place that where people can have a family life and have, and have mm -hmm. a, an interesting and challenging career. Um, I'm not, I'm sure we don't always get that right. Uh, what would people bring to what, you know, what, do you mean what? What? What, yeah, what, what are we what looking sort of for? Personality, yeah, yeah. What sort of um, person that maybe sharing? I don't know, value or values or ethics that you have. People who are curious, I think. People who are uh, um, people who want to learn. I mean, it's a long takes a long time to become a, an architect, um, and to have the confidence to you know step out into the world and design. You know, spend a lot of your clients' money, um, but. Yeah, curiosity, uh, innovation. Um, I think being uh, wanting to be self-directed or wanting to sort of use your own initiative, I think that's something that's very important to us. Um, we like learning from the people that work with us as much as, as you know, they might want to learn from us. There's quite a lot of people from our office here tonight. Thank you all for coming. And, um, you know, uh, it's... The, we have a lot of people in our office who are not architects, you know, and um, they bring a huge amount of value uh, to, to the organization, and we learn as much from them, too. So. Mm. Those are good, good values to have anywhere. It doesn't matter where you work, right? Exactly. Um, mm. One very last question regarding your background or your upbringing. I wonder what gives you coming back to South Africa, it's time you can, mm -hmm. and what that you cannot find here. <laughs> and wow. super briefly, it, if possible, I know, it's, it's, I know it's difficult, 
what do you think London or the UK could or should learn from South Africa? Um, to laugh more, I think. It's just, you know, South it's a, it, you can't, it's, they're so different. South Africa is an extraordinary place. You know, there are 11 official, la official mm. languages. There are, you know, the landscape is huge and beautiful. And, um, but I don't know, the people are just amazing. So, and they laugh a lot. So it's, and, and that's what you look when you go, try to go, go there, that <laughs> loving people. Friends, That's what I enjoy the most about going, going there is the people. I mean, I have very good friends there, so mm. obviously that's always lovely. I, my father passed away um, some years ago now, so my main reason for needing to go back every, you know, every year or every, as often as I could is, is not there, but I, I still go back to see friends. But mm. it's just, you know, the, the people, whenever I'm there, the people, are, it, it, it's just, it just makes me smile. It's just... Um, a different approach to life and it's very joyful so sounds good take us with you <laughs> Cindy thank you a lot for your talk we really appreciate it and it's a uh, pleasure. we will chat later in the round table discussion all together okay? brilliant thank, thank you. you thank you Cindy